Okay, and now we're recording. Good, so if there's no questions or comments on the agenda, I guess we'll go to the first item. So Karsten, would you like to take over? Yes, thank you. Um, so we have been running the, the hackathon for about 24 hours uh, now, and um, <laughs> apparently very few people actually had lots of time to prepare something. Uh, so the, the biggest item that we have and that we are currently looking at is uh, Michael Costa's proposal on, on doing a proxy to, to a Modbus uh, environment. Uh, but the, let, let me start from, from the beginning. Uh, so what, what we said, what we wanted to look at in this hackathon is essentially uh, five things. Actually, we, we first said four, and then we found we have to do the fifth as well. Um, validating SDF 1.1, which is uh, in, in a consensus call in the ASDF working group right now. So just making sure that our all of our tools and all of our models are up to SDF 1.1. So this is kind of a background activity because it's probably not going to consume a lot of cycles, but uh, we, we want to get it done by the end of uh, this week. Or if it does consume cycles, then we have found something that we have to talk about. Um, the second thing is uh, to continue work on the semantic proxy uh, idea. So that, that has been around for a while and um, we, we still plan to have OMA and OCF implementations uh, talk to each other um, guided by common SDF, so no, no uh, um, ad hoc support for the other uh, ecosystem in, in the uh, respective implementations, but uh, trying to, to glue them together by uh, common SDF and uh, mapping files. And th that's really the, the focus of this um, hackathon from my point of view, getting this mapping file uh, concept a little bit further off, off the ground. So we, we all have done something in the space of mapping files, but uh, we, at some point we probably need to turn this into a coherent vision. And um, another thing that we want to do is we want to uh, spend work specifically uh, talking to the Web of Things ecosystem. So that there is uh, there are thing descriptions that have a lot of things that, that SDF doesn't have. Um, so um, is there something that, that uh, uh, would go into SDF or is there something that would go into mapping files and so on? So that's something we want to uh, look at. And uh, finally, uh, it turns out that we probably need a little bit stronger consensus on the processing uh, model. So how, how do we actually make use of all this. For a single SDF model, it, it's pretty clear what this does. It describes the, the uh, interactions and, and the, the data that, that is going into and coming out of the interactions um, of, of a specific aspect of a thing. Um, but what does it mean to, to have a mapping file? So how, how does the mapping file interact uh, with one or more existing uh, models and, and um, how do you actually cross-link? Um, how, how do you do references? Uh, how does the namespacing uh, work and so on? So th this is a, a rough overview of uh, what we were uh, trying to do. And before I go into uh, more detail just on the mapping file concept, just a little bit uh, more about uh, the, the logistics. Uh, so we want to have... Uh, a daily coordination call, and, and this time it will happen right after the uh, Wishy call. We had one on Monday, uh, and uh, we plan to have one on Wednesday. So th these dates were pretty much determined by other meetings. And on Thursday, we still have a choice, and, and probably we will move to 1600 on Thursday. But uh, let's see, we just have to decide that. So we do this in a WebEx room that, that is permanently open during the, the entire um, hackathon. Uh, and if you want to click on these links, you, you cannot do this in, in uh, uh, WebEx, but uh, of course, these slides are in the 
uh, wishy uh, GitHub repository. So if you go to uh, GitHub T2TRG wishy, uh, then you can find this uh, these slides under slides and can click on things. So there is a link to the wiki. There is a link to the day-to-day -day notes uh, that that you can uh, look at. <clears throat> okay, so back to to mapping files. Um, the, the mapping files are a general concept of, of doing something, doing some, some specification or modeling uh, work that somehow attaches to SDF specifications and uh, bridges these specifications into something. And that something can be a, a whole ecosystem. So there might be an IPSO mapping file, for instance, that would be used in an OMI, OMA um, uh, environment. Um, so uh, for IPSO, the, the most important thing that people have been talking about is assigning IDs, because in, in IPSO, everything has numbers. And uh, we, we didn't want to put these numbers into the common SDF models, because these numbers only really mean something. Uh, in the IPSO, in the OMA lightweight M2M uh, environment. So being able to write a mapping file that, that uh, supplies uh, these IDs uh, to uh, generic uh, SDF models sounds like a good idea. And we, we have examples for that in the repositories. But we also have uh, an example in the exploratory repository that, that goes a little beyond that and actually not just defines IDs, but uh, also defines representation data types. So the, the, the data types in the SDF file are on the uh, information model level, but at least that's what we are trying to do here. And uh, we may need to uh, transform these into ecosystem specific types like 16 bit uh, values or something. Uh, which uh, maybe are not meaningful common uh, types. So we don't want to do this SDF, at the SDF level, but uh, the, the mapping file should be able to provide the information. I'll have an example for that in a moment. So that, that's one category of mapping files, ecosystem specific mapping files. So they, they would apply to any use of an SDF model in an ecosystem. So you would have a pretty good idea whether you are applying this mapping file at a specific time or not because you would know which ecosystem you are in. Now that's very different from instance specific uh, mapping files, which could, for instance, provide protocol parameters. So which IP address are you using? Uh, what, what exactly is, is your backnet ID or your, your Modbus, whatever that is called there? Um, so the, these are really things that are specific to an instance. And there may also be non-technical instance information. So you might want to know whether the, the, the uh, uh, temperature sensor uh, you are talking about is, is uh, uh, out on, on the terrace or is, is inside the living room. Or is it the temperature sensor that, that measures the room temperature or is it the temperature sensor that uh, measures the inside temperature of, of the fridge? And um, Finally, we probably need data models for these instant mappings. So the, the, the protocol parameters, um, the, these are in, in some instance-specific mapping files. But then you want to make sure that the instance-specific mapping files actually make sense, because you have many of them. You don't have a single one that is carefully crafted by an by, by, by a, a standards maker, you, you have many of them. So you need, essentially need a data model for these instant instance mapping files. So that, that's uh, probably one of the fun parts that, that we have to uh, look at. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we need to have some, some idea of um, how uh, an implementation would find out which of these many instance-specific mapping files to actually uh, activate. So how, how do these mapping files actually come into force? If you have 20 of them, which one are you using? So let, let's talk about these, these mapping file uh, schema thing that, that I just alluded to. 
Um, so SDF has been terminally confusing to people because we have two levels here. We have the the SDF model, which is uh, represented in JSON, and we have a formal description technique, and we are using both the CDDL and JSON schema org here. Um, that, that is in the SDF Internet Draft that describes how these models are, are looking like. So we have a meta model uh, that describes the model. And the, the model itself talks about data. And just to confuse things, uh, it uses data schemas that look a lot like JSON schema org. So when people have been talking about the schema uh, with respect to, to SDF, you never knew whether they were talking about the the uh, meta model or the model, and now it's getting worse because we not only have the the uh, model and uh, the the uh, which has a, sp a specific structure and uh, uh, some data schemas that are in that model, but we also have a layer three or level three. Uh, which would be a meta meta model for the meta models that specify what's uh, in in uh, a mapping file. Um, so uh, th that will require a, a lot of discipline in in discussion to to point out which which of them uh, are we talking about. So one one of the layer three models that people have been using so far is a simple one of augmentation. So you, you take an, an SDF specification and you just augment the, the qualities that are in the SDF specification by additional ones. And, and you can put any um, quality there you want. Uh, so you don't need more meta model at, at layer three than just saying you can add qualities. But I think before long, this will become a very, very, uh, chaotic, and so we, we may need to invest some time uh, into uh, layer three here as well. So that's something that, that came up in the discussion yesterday and that, that I wanted to clarify uh, a little bit because uh, when people talk about schemas, you never know which of the levels uh, they, they are talking about. Um, so the, the other thing that uh, came up is that uh, when we model something in a mapping file, uh, we may not just be modeling things by, by, by adding information to the um, SDF file, um, but this uh, what we are actually modeling there is a transformation. Um, so, um, for instance, uh, we may need to define parameters that need to be added to, to the abstract SDF model for protocol bindings. Uh, so that, that's a pretty simple transformation again, that, that's just the augmentation um, approach. Um, but uh, here already we have two different kinds of information, which is uh, instance information, uh, which look different for, for each instance, and invariant information, for instance, the IPSO IDs. Um, so uh, what, what happens in, in that augmentation is, is slightly different between the two cases. Yeah, and uh, actually you have three levels, right? Because you have the standard terms, you have the model terms, and then you have the instance terms, right? Yes. And um, yeah, I, I, I was not really trying to, to get the first bullet crystal clear. I think we, we have to still have to discuss that. Um, the second bullet um, is about um, mapping, actually mapping. So the, the abstract SDF model uh, may talk about the temperature. And uh, in the abstract model, uh, for instance, we might decide, well, okay, this is uh, um, a temperature in Kelvin or something else, uh, whatever. And uh, then when we go into an ecosystem, we might uh, find that uh, the specific sensor we are talking about uh, actually provides uh, the temperature in uh, centi Celsius or something like that. Um, so we will need to do a linear transformation uh, here 
And uh, obviously, not all transformations are just linear. So there, there are a million color models, for instance, which are probably the, the worst example of trans nonlinear transformations. Uh, but it may also be something simpler, like going from, from a, a power uh, or, or a voltage uh, to a level. So you, you have a log log logarithmic uh, relationship. And you may even need to do structural transforms because uh, somebody is describing a light by, by its intensity and its uh, color temperature and uh, somebody else is uh, describing it by, by RGB values. Um, so um, I'm not saying that, that uh, we need to be able to express all that, um, but I'm saying we, we maybe in, uh, need to be in a position to actually point two places where these are uh, expressed. So that, that's where the transformation comes in. It's not sufficient to say this is an RGB value uh, and, and then have a, a common model that says it's a, a whatever, an LAB value, uh, but you need to, to explain how the transformation actually uh, happens. Well, in this case, it's easy because LAB is, is, is at least a defined standard and there are defined standards for, for RGB, like sRGB and so on, so you may be able to use a standard uh, transformation. Maybe, yeah, qu quick comment. I mean, on, on the, some, many of the basic units, thanks to the cinema registry, we actually have the linear transformations uh, covered to some extent uh, programmatically. Yes. So I guess that's one part where we can refer to, but yeah, then there's a whole area beyond that that is going to be more tricky. But I think if we can get there, you know, 50%, 80% range covered, that could be helping a lot on, 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 the, on the practical world. Yeah, as long as you're talking about units, uh, I think we are indeed uh, uh, covered. Uh, but then there are things like, is this an 8-bit value or a 16-bit value? And uh, are we using an offset representation or uh, tools complement representation and, and so on and so on? So th there are lots of things that are going on. Um, when you go in into device specific uh, uh, data, and uh, we need to be able to, to talk about that. Okay, so let, let's just uh, uh, finish this. I'm already five minutes uh, over schedule uh, with looking at a few examples. So this is the the basic ID thing. So we we have an SDF object level. And this gets an ID eight. So this is not an IPSO example, but the, the IPSO examples look, look uh, similar. That's simple augmentation, great. The the only thing that that's missing for me is I would like to be able to say um, IPSO IDs are between one thousand and ten thousand or something like that. Uh, I currently cannot say that. I, I can write the the mapping files, but I cannot help. Um, yeah, check these uh, mapping files. So that's one place where we we don't have the meta model that would meta meta model that would uh, help us. And the other observation is uh, th this uh, kind of mapping would always be active. So you you know that in a, a ZCL environment you would have this this mapping active. So we essentially just need some something in the info block of this mapping file that tells us what what area of application uh, this has. So that, that that's relatively easy. Now, one other thing that, that uh, Michael had in, in his example uh, was uh, mapping the, the abstract values in the SDF uh, specifications to, to concrete values for the ecosystem. So in, in this uh, ecosystem, move step mode values have a zero for up and uh, one for down. And uh, um, so we, we are essentially using a, a JSON schema org a schema here to, to provide a constant value. Maybe that's overkill, um, but uh, um, at least it, it, something we all understand at this point in time. Um, and um, yeah, th this works great for SDF choice because we have uh, discrete uh, addressable uh, values here, each value uh, that is possible has a JSON pointer. 
uh, so we can establish uh, a mapping nicely. But as soon as we have uh, larger value spaces, 16-bit, uh, 32-bit, floating point, whatever, uh, that doesn't really work uh, uh, anymore. And again, yeah, so maybe being in, in the uh, Zigbee environment, um, Zigbee cluster library environment uh, uh, activates this automatically, but yeah, it, it becomes a little bit more interesting here. So on, on this slide here, we could simply not use ID, but use ZCL ID, and we would have uh, a clear separation from an IPSO ID that might also be, be um, assigned here. Um, on this slide, it, it's actually the data value. So it's not, not quite clear whether we have a Zigbee zero and, and an OMA zero. Um, I think there's only one zero. Uh, so we need a different way to actually activate uh, this mapping. <clears throat> so how does the, the transformation info uh, work? So th that's from the example. The, the example currently just says it, it's 16 bits, so we have two to the 16 uh, values, but it doesn't tell us how we are going to use these uh, bits. So are we two complement or offset? Or uh, There are many ways to, to skin uh, this cat. And uh, then we have the, the um, instance-specific information. And actually, not all of this information is instance-specific, so it, it's currently all just meshed up. Um, so we, we are simply using a, a Web of Things protocol binding here with an href and, and then some Modbus uh, specific uh, things like unit IDs and entities and offset and length and so on. <clears throat> so these are register numbers, if I understand this correctly. And uh, interestingly, this actually, this example shows one concept that we probably need um, uh, the, the href actually is a template. It's it's not a final value because, because it says this IP address. So um, when we go to an actual instance mapping, then we can put the actual IP address uh, in there. But uh, if we um, are talking about Modbus mapping in in uh, at the class <laughs> level we need to say, where does this parameter actually come from? Yeah, I'm not using any Zipper template syntax here. We've been using URI templates for such things. There are, are some variant of that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which I think is, is uh, pretty symptomatic here because URI templates uh, really look great uh, the first five minutes you look at them and uh, <laughs> then things are getting complicated. Well, we don't use the complicated subset mostly. We just use the simple substitution. But I should also mention we have two places we use them, both the model level and at the um uh, there's two different places we need them. And so we have to use both single curly braces and double curly braces in different places to distinguish the two cases. Anyways, there's a big discussion about this in, in the lot right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we that that's really a problem that we need to understand. So uh, one thing that I learned from the SGML world um, is that uh, when SGL, SGML was used for more and more complicated applications, uh, the SGML people tried to solve problems by doing syntactic uh, uh, expansion. So, so essentially a macro level style thing. And uh, this this made some things possible, but it really made it hard to to process these macros in any meaningful way. So they, they could only be uh, created by humans, and they could never be understood by by machines that were trying to do anything but just simply applying uh, them. So I think we need to to discuss at some point whether this is just a syntactical thing, like in URL templates, or maybe a little more. So I think we all understand something needs to be done here. So there, there is something like a concept of a parameter. Right. Um, so um, Jan has uh, actually provided uh, one one more example for, of a, a mapping specification, uh, which has the interesting uh, property that it actually doesn't start from the, the SDF namespace, but it comes from the ecosystem namespace. So th there is a, a co-op 
uh, server here, and that exposes two uh, paths to URIs, uh, switch value and, and switch on. And uh, essentially the mapping file tells you uh, from there uh, which SDF object and SDF property actually is being described and add security and, and uh, whatever the, the method uh, that you use. So that, that's a different way of looking at uh, mapping files. The, the pointers are uh, reversed. And I think it, it's a good idea to think about this kind of mapping as well, because it may be much more natural uh, to someone who actually has such a device to say which parts of the device actually uh, are, uh, are mapping to which parts of the SDF world instead of uh, the other way around. And that reminds me of the difference structurally between thing description and swagger. And there are definitely times when, as you say, one is more natural to uh, yeah. describe things than the other. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I think what TDs and Swagger are kind of transposes of each other in exactly this nature. One has a list of interaction, like uh, URLs, and then describes the interaction, and the other has a list of interactions and describes the URLs they map to. And they're equivalent, but you know, it's a little confusing when you're reading one and expecting the other. And it seems like we really should have some way of in our protocol of our binding and instance bindings in SDF to sort of accommodate both of those. Yeah, I well, think that's a good approach. <clears throat> Michael, you, you want to say something? Oh, no, I'm just kind of waiting for an opportunity to give a brain dump on some more things we're doing in what, but I'll let you. Okay, so let me finish my slides because yeah. <clears throat> this is my last slide. So th there are a few things that need to be done. And uh, one of which is understanding the processing model better. I ha had this, that on the, the first uh, slide in this segment. Uh, build more Strawman examples like the above and, and use these Strawman examples to understand the elements of the meta and meta meta uh, models. So that would be my program for for the rest of the um, hackathon to get um, a little bit further in in these three items. So I'm done. Okay. So I just want to say a few things about what. Um, so first of all, we're working on a couple of things that are related to things you mentioned. So one of them is we have a thing model now formally included in the TD spec or the 1.1 TD spec. And that basically, you know, overlaps a lot with the kind of the modeling aspects of SDF. And so I think we want to make the trees all align and have some kind of interconvertibility and be able to generate TMs from SDF models and so forth. Um, I think that the other thing we're working on though is a discovery spec, which allows us to do like semantic queries and I, I actually shared a link already in the notes about a uh, uh, an issue or a project where we're looking at, you know, can we use uh, 1DM and STF uh, source uh, semantic annotations in thing descriptions? And I think generally we want to do as much as we can to make these things consistent. So we're not using different syntaxes for the same thing and that sort of thing. Um, there's one more project I want to mention is lately we're working on geolocation information for TDs. And so I have a proposal and I'll just share a link here in the minutes in a second to find it. I, I'm also kind of encouraged by the work we're doing the description and incorporating uh, JSON pointers. And being able to do sort of things using JSON pointers in thing model. Uh, that, that's that basically opens up a lot of possibilities also. Yeah, hold on a second. Stupid uh, editor put the link in the wrong place. One second here. I had a link handy and then I tried to type it in and it put it somewhere weird. One second. Uh, where are we? Uh, um, so hold on. Uh, right, right. So that's actually decent point is another issue. Let me get back to that. So I just clicked a link to an issue where we're putting it together uh, geolocation information model. And we're talking with various people in like OGC and you know, GeoSparkle and stuff like this. 
trying to get some consistent information model and query language for our directories to be able to query locations of devices. So it'd be really great if we could maybe also work on, for example, an SDF capability for geolocation that use the same information model. Because if the information model is the same, we can interconvert things, but it's, it's different, then it's more of a problem. So let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's try and converge on that. Regarding JSON pointers, uh, we've recently discovered several uses for JSON pointers for referring to parts of TDs. So for example, geolocation, you know, we could have static or dynamic geolocation. So is the location embedded in the TD or is it in a property? And so the idea is we add a link, which has a JSON pointer, which then points to where the geolocation is. And it might be in the same TD, it might be in a different TD, it might be in a property in a thing, in the same thing or a different thing. And so the idea is to use a JSON pointer for that. We also recently added JSON pointers to refer to elements of data models from inside security schemes, for example, give up an embedded key or something. So anyways, I know you recently had a discussion about put JSON pointers in URLs. I think we should, uh, you know, converge on a common syntax for that. And finally, as I just mentioned before, TMs actually include uh, URI templates. And we also have URI templates for data models embedded in things. So we have two different levels of parameters and we actually use a double curly brace and thing models and a single curly brace for data model type URI parameters to distinguish them. And it'd be kind of nice to discuss how we use URI templates, uh, you know, and maybe come to some consistent agreement on, on what parameters look like. Um, so those are a few things. And I'm going to be attending the IETF hackathons. I can only attend today's and tomorrow's meetings because of conflicts. So what I've been doing is we can create issues. I just pointed to two of them in the Watt plug fest, which is happening concurrently. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, work on things in the issue tracker or uh, in the Watt plug fest meetings. Okay, I'll stop my brain dump there, but if people have questions, we can certainly discuss things more. Oh, and also finally one more thing. For the directories, we actually have three query languages. So we have Sparkle, okay, for semantic stuff. We have JSON path, and one thing I need to do is look at the recent JSON path standardization activity in IETF. One of our problems is JSON path is not a standard. It's just a blog post, basically. Uh, and then thirdly, there's XPath, which is a standard, but uses XML syntax, which is not very friendly to using JSON. So one thing we're going to look at is, uh, you know, ideally there'd be some JSON path syntax that was semantically equivalent to the XPath syntax, so you can interconvert them easily. Because they're both syntactic, basically, as opposed to semantic. So it's another activity that I think uh, if you guys are doing the directory service or that supports queries, we should also negotiate on. And actually for geolocation is also going to be a, a set of queries. Uh, and for geolocation, it turns out uh, we just identified two classes of queries. One is point and radius. So like latitude and longitude and accuracy. The other is actually point, direction, and field of view, which shows up in augmented reality applications when I want to know things in my field of view. Um, and also distance, like uh, minimum, maximum distance in the field of view. So we're going to be trying to define some query filters for geolocation information in our directory sources also. That's all documented in the geolocation proposal linked from issue 100 above. Great, thank you for the summary. And I'll, I'll be talking about some of this as well during my 15 minute brain dump in the IETF uh, session as well. Great. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I used exactly double the amount of time that we ha have allocated. So maybe we should uh, quickly jump to the next uh, item, uh, which is the yes. technology landscape update. 
Yes, but that's okay. It was an interesting discussion and it was very, very topical and relevant for the ongoing work. So that, that, thanks a lot, guys. We can do a shorter on the way forward segment. So, but yes, um, please go, go ahead, Milan. And if you're talking, you are currently muted. I can send you an unmute request. So right now we are not hearing anything and looking at a black screen. But we do see your cursor. Ah, very nice. We still can't hear you. WebEx is now unmuted. Okay, what we could do is um, do a few minutes on the WCFA way forward while we wait for Milan to um, get his audio working. So Milan, let us know when you get things working and then we can jump back to your, your segment. Okay, um, so, so this is very, Reform segments. As I mentioned in the beginning of the intro, we've been very much focused on the ASDF uh, and SDF one DM work in in the in the wishes so far, and we certainly, as as Karsten already identified, there's a bunch of things <clears throat> we can be working on 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 SDF, or also also going forward. Um, so that that's kind of one piece of work what we can be tackling in this group. Then, of course, the question is, what are the other things that should be on our agenda and, and we would like to be progressing here? Of course, one aspect that is very much related to the ASDF is uh, we had the discussion with the um, uh, Microsoft Azure Digital Twin Definition Language um, of folks. So I think that's something that we should pick on and also think about how it fits to the ASDF work, but then also in general, of, of on our quest of understanding the, the landscape better. And then the whole topic of, of other hypermedia um, and, and semantics uh, topics. So I could open up a floor here for a couple of minutes while we wait for Milan to any thoughts on what are the topics you, you would like to, you would like us to continue here on, on the WISHI work. Uh, Nicholas here. Uh, I think it's, I mean, bringing in the Microsoft folks, as you said, is, is a good thing. And if we can do the same with other ecosystems, that's also, I think this could be a good venue, a sort of good, maybe more neutral venue than ASDF directly uh, to, to lift these things and discuss them. I uh, think a similar, similarly, I think that there are a couple of things that are sort of gaps and missing right now. One, one of them is um, when you look at the kind of models that are created with OPC UA and to some extent even digital twin models, they include modeling a lot of physical concepts that aren't really IoT gadgets or don't really have, uh, you know, uh, affordances and interfaces, but they're still necessary to make the, the whole graph and we need to at least figure out how to connect to those and maybe some standard ways of expanding the workout into the sort of 
I've been calling it feature of interest, but there's really a lot more to it than that. I think there's sort of a quantities and units as, as we were looking at earlier. There's some places there where it doesn't have much bottom right now. <laughs> you can look at it. Whoa, there's a big problem here. There's a big thing to be solved. The other thing is, I think we've been uh, kind of wandering around assuming that the, the ultimate IoT system is where all the things are autonomous and talk to each other and there are no intermediaries, bridges or gateways or any of that. And, and I think that that's just wrong. I think we need to acknowledge that the, the systems are layered and think about, start thinking about that a little bit more. I know we call it thing to thing research group. So, you know, it's like kind of like thumbing, thumbing my nose at that a little bit, but also to uh, figure out, well, what we're really doing is orchestrating things with logic. So the other thing that's missing is how do we describe logic and the way that logic uh, connects to things? So this is like, you know, programs and, you know, things like that, of the, the, um, the inner workings of things. And so those are, I think, a couple of big gaps and it's not exactly aligned with hypermedia interfaces, but it also kind of connects to the whole semantic problem. Both of those. Yeah, one other word for logic is mobile code. That's that's a, a way of, of handling it. And so, you know, if you if you say it's a mobile code problem and you have to figure out how to define new, you know, architecturally neutral handlers and how to connect to those, that's a I think that's a great approach. And that fits with the hypermedia description. It's one of the fielding uh, <laughs> categories. So, oh, by the way, regarding hypermedia, one thing we did recently was discuss how to do error handling in thing descriptions. And I'm not sure if error handling has been added to SDF, but there's kind of this whole issue of alternative responses to interactions and distinguishing them and which ones are errors and need you to raise an exception and so forth. Our discussion on that was that sort of a lot of that might be protocol binding, but also applications. I need to be aware of that. So there's some some sort of cross layer connection that's needed. Um, yeah, the, the annoying part things. was that um, well, syntactically we had to do it ended up mixing up protocol and application logic layers uh, because we had to embed. Uh, but that was a syntactic issue. That we realized that a lot of errors are like you know, the servers down. So that's not really an application level problem. It's like an infrastructure level problem. So, um, so a lot of these error responses are in fact protocol level issues, or the packets got lost, or something. But anyways, errors are important, and this is something that we uh, were missing compared to Swagger, so we added it recently. But it's still the issue of what is the semantic of an error. Uh, and are there any cases where you might have multiple successful responses? Um, what do you do about that? Mm -hmm. Indeed, very good points. Thanks, thanks, guys. Sorry if, if Milan has now. Yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Or... No. I'm hearing it twice, actually, on both. Oh, I have it. This is. I can I can mute one of you. So if you know oh, talk. No, oh okay. Um apologies. I, I muted the one you didn't leave. So you now need to unmute. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Embarrassing thing to use Apple Bluetooth headphones with a Windows PC always leads to problems. And uh, anyway, so I'm just with wired headphones, never mind that. Um, so I was tasked with doing the update of something that we actually started the discussion on um, in our July meeting uh, of last year. So the time flies. And if you remember, which probably don't. At that point, we made a proposal to write a paper that would sort of list the criteria for how to describe standards and what they are trying to do, and also what they are assuming implicitly or explicitly in terms of environment and node capability 
and what happens at design time versus what happens at prime time and what nodes can describe and what nodes can discover. And basically things like that make a consistent presentation in a, a sort of mutually agreed upon terminology and serve as a mechanism for being able to describe various standard efforts along those lines. So people who want to use them or maybe want to work with them can uh, more easily understand how they relate and what they do and don't do and what they assume and don't assume and by virtue if you, they don't assume something then you have to provide other means of, of, of getting those things done and, and so we had a list of criteria at that time which is somewhere in the bowels of the Vichy thing and I'm beginning to think of this and we said we're going to just do the high level description not the details of the standards themselves uh, in other words, not to re-describe them because it's demanding and not a judgment whether it's good or bad, it's just basically what it is. And as I was thinking about it, it almost may be a partially good analogy is to think of the food labels that you get on the food product. So there is a standardized way of, of the amount uh, and how many calories there is and what are the nutritional ingredients and the value and stuff like that, but at least it's in a way that can be compared as opposed to uh, the way it used to be before that, but when everybody starts with a different quantity and then comes up with different numbers. Anyway, so we presented the comment of the common criteria at that time that didn't get uh, much discussion, and it turned out at that time that Michael Costa and Michael McCool had worked on comparing various standards along some common criteria in terms of attributes and features, you know, what they do and how they do it. And, and there are some tables in existence from both at, at the various degrees of, of completion that were offered uh, as, as contribution to that work. I haven't, uh, I haven't had the chance to synchronize with Michael K on uh, Ed McCool on that, but in a moment it's going to become clear that you know we can defer that for the time being. Uh, so it turns out as I was thinking about it, and you know, a reason why it didn't quite get off the ground is that the goal of describing, you know, providing all of this that I said, plus describing some key standards along those lines, to, you know, as an existence proof and, and, and a comparison, turns out to be far too ambitious because uh, there are many intricate details and things. Uh, so basically I'm proposing a revised approach to write a sort of position document that describes the criteria, how to compare them and all the other things we discussed. And then rather than describing standards, which, which as I said, turned out to be a difficult part, invite interested SDOs if they want to describe how their standard fits into that nomenclature and terminology or not, and we could uh, use appendices for those if and when we have them. But the point is, instead of going for the whole thing, criteria plus descriptions, let's start with the criteria as a position paper, and, and uh, do the same thing basically. I, I this time really volunteered to do the first draft that we can uh, then discuss and uh, thrash and, and elicit feedback of this work group uh, and, and revise the paper, produce the approved document, approved in the sense that the group says, okay, this is how far we're going to get with it, not necessarily published, and then invite standards SDOs if they want to contribute. And if we are successful, we can use the feedback from them also revise the criteria and paper because some, some things will, will, will need adjustment. And with or without those descriptions, publish the paper. I even went through the Byzantine process of doing XML to RFC and all the other good stuff. So it can be basically an RFC like uh, format, even the draft which we proposed. So operationally, basically, I, I, I said I, I have finally committed the time to do the outline of this and then we can, you know, we can discuss it as a concrete thing rather than a concept. And I don't know whether it's um, in terms of just logistics, uh, the RFC format is probably what it's going to end up being. It's a little harder to edit than the word, but probably it's better to start in that format. Carson, do you think we should RFC the format from beginning draft or, or leave it for later? Well, actually, <clears throat> Ten years ago, I wrote a little tool that allows you to write RFC-style documents in Markdown. 
and uh, that that has been widely uh, accepted by people who are doing uh, IETF work. So that's probably what I would recommend at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm aware of it. I haven't uh, looked at it. I was using the XML to RFC macros in the beginning and trying to get that to work with it. Anyway, so we find we can do that uh, offline. And uh, so, as I said, I'll volunteer. I think it's going to, I have some travel plans to Europe late April, so between now and then I'll definitely have a draft. Uh, and, and, and just put it uh, on, on, on the mailing list or discuss it in subsequent meetings if we have it. And uh, if uh, there are any volunteer co authors, that would be great. If not, uh, I'll draft out and then we'll take it from there. Maybe some people will be very nice. So yeah. that's basically where it stands at this point. Uh, as I said, it was too heavy baggage with criteria and the descriptions of dropping the descriptions or at least referring them, uh, then I think it becomes uh, uh, manageable and, and then we can decide whether it's worth pursuing anyway. So uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's easier task. So Milan, this kind of fell off my plate, but um, I'm still interested in contributing. If you can maybe send me an email, we can maybe, maybe if the three of us meet separately offline, we can make some faster progress in a smaller group. Yes, and, and those who are interested, just it came to my attention recently, there is a white paper from IIC, uh, Characteristics of IIoT Information Models. I think oh, really? they try to do the similar thing uh, and, and describe some standards along those lines, and when you read it, you find out it's a difficult tasks so for this approach, maybe better. Well, uh, Nick, Nicholas uh, is uh, has just authored a white paper that discusses that. And um, wait, is Nicholas on? Maybe not. Um, oh, okay, I guess not. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's why I'm here. Sorry, it. I was distracted for a second. Sorry. Yeah, the other thing is the hackathon is going to start in one minute. So maybe we should yeah. wrap and switch. Michael, yeah. you posted, uh, his paper discusses what, Nicholas? Yeah, so um, I uh, I co-authored the paper in a uh, white paper we're in the IIC Industrial Internet Consortium yeah. on on information models and comparison and meta meta models and you know, making these collaborate in the industrial uh, environment. And we have a description of of both IPSO and and one DM there together. Other folks yeah, wrote yeah. about OPC UA and so on. So uh, that's maybe something to look at as well. Uh, <clears throat> bring into this. Yeah, I have and 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 uh, criteria. Except as I said, I would I'm suggesting that here we defer the discussion of specific standards therein because, as you see, you know, as you know from it's, it's difficult and gets dispersed. So I, I, I'll start with the criteria first at this point and take that into consideration. You guys have done some very good work there. I read yeah. it yesterday. Yeah. I didn't pick the class in this too. I know that you had a go out and see this paper. Okay, great. Thanks. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Milan. Yeah, unfortunately, we're running over time now. We need to move yeah. to the hackathon okay. coordination. Um, one thing we could do, I mean, we could briefly mention about this in an upcoming Team Thing RG summary meeting. That could also, you know, get you have extra volunteers at least for reviewing this. I think it's a very interesting piece. And um and very good if you and, and McCool and other interested can get a you know have a side meeting and, and see the best way to progress this. If you manage to come up with some plans before Thursday next week, I mean, we could have a, you know, flash those in the summary meeting as, as one option. Just let us, let us know if that's a, that's something you would you like know. us to do. Okay. Perfect. Well, with, with that, um, we'll have to take the future wish meeting planning offline, but thanks a lot for everyone joining today. This was a very good discussion. I was looking forward to discuss with you all more soon again. And I think many of you will be joining for the uh, Akaton coordination call started already one minute ago. So see you on that side. Thank you and bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.